This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Friends in Christ, how good it is to be gathered here in this place to worship God together. As we begin our worship, there are a whole bunch of announcements here in the worship bulletin. First, I'd like to direct your attention to the back cover where we introduce our speaker today and speaker for this weekend, Avery Davis Lamb, the co-executive director of Creation Justice Ministries. We've had a great weekend. Uh, yesterday, um, we explored with uh, under Avery's leadership uh, the many places in Scripture where uh, we are where our care for creation, our role as in the unity of creation is so well pointed out. And then in the, we learned also about many congregations around the country that are engaged in doing this kind of work. So that was encouragement to us to not only see the things that we're already doing, but also to spur our imaginations about what we can be doing uh, to encourage creation justice. And then last night we heard him speak about uh, the calling to hospitality as those who are involved in creation justice. And then this morning we've been exploring scripture about what scripture calls us to do as co-creators with God. Uh, and what a wonderful conversation we had. So we're glad you're here. Welcome. Welcome. Also in your uh, worship bulletin, you'll see the announcement for a congregational meeting. There's a congregational meeting next Sunday, the 21st, following this worship service to elect deacons, a couple of deacons and a couple of elders to fill uh, some vacancies that we have on our boards. So that's following worship next Sunday. Let's see. Um, I think Bobby Joe has an announcement for us. Step right up there. Good morning. I hope this works. Next Saturday is the talent auction from three to six here in Fellowship Hall. And I know you've heard a lot about it, but some of you who have never come, it is an actual live auction. And it is a lot of fun. It can get a little fierce bidding at times. I've been involved in that. Um, but it is a lot of fun. And we need you to come. Um, and celebrate that with us. There um, are some uh, world famous um, no-bake cookies on there, donated by maybe someone, me. Um, there are some soups on there, there are dinners on the list, there's photo sessions. Um, so you may not walk away with something, but you will walk away with um, an, opportunity. an opportunity. Thank you, that was not a word I did have on my little list here. I know there's a ton going on next week here at Wayside, there's gonna be grounds clean up, there's sandwich making, there's um, Presbyterian women or somewhere. Come at the end of the evening to sit and enjoy and have some fun, some fellowship, some food. Um, we will ask if you come, if you can bring an appetizer to share or a dessert to share. We will provide some sandwiches and we will take time throughout the evening to, to eat. Um, the other thing I ask you to do is bring your checkbook or your credit card because that's how you'll pay for the donations. There will also be some silent bidding if you're not involved in the, in the live bidding, but there will be silent bidding on some baskets. So please come, bring your friends. You don't have to be a Wayside member to come. Um, bring your friends. It's a great way to get to know people and their talents and meet other people at Wayside. So thank you. Thank you. Did you have something I think you wanted to say? Two quick things. First, on the second Saturday of, first Saturday of May, um, Wow Club invites all families with second through sixth graders. So even if you haven't been part of our Wednesday fellowship, if you're in second through sixth grade, we're going to go out to Camp Mission Meadows for climbing and swimming and, um, and lunch. And even if the weather's bad, it's an indoor pool. So you're set. Um, so just let me know, and we're asking just a $10 per child uh, just to cover, just to mitigate things. Um, but also, if you're a parent, if you want to swim, you can swim. Just, you know, fill out your permission slip, too. And then finally, um, we have been so blessed by Alex Wells in our, our child care. And she's getting ready to graduate from college. And so is beginning, we'll be transitioning out of that position um, her last day will be May 26. So I'm asking you to put on your radar anybody that you know who would be gifted in um, looking in, in kind of childcare, 
um, there starting June 2nd um, and just kind of be on the lookout and communicate with us. We have a job description and would love to hear from some folks who would be good for that. So thank you. is hosting an offering of letters from Bread for the World. We're asking you to write your two senators and your congressmen, um, asking them to pass the farm bill. There's some specifics in the letter. What we need from you is your name and your address. If you're able to write a sentence or two, I encourage people to write something that you've been involved with with Wayside, whether you've packed the lunches for the homeless, whether you've brought food in for the food pantry, whether you helped buy a ham for, the, you know, for our local uh, West Mill Creek food pantry, something that you've done to, to spark your desire to help fight hunger. They are, will be in the lobby. Um, after next week, Nikki Jarris and I will go locally and take these letters to the three offices uh, here in Erie. And then this year, this is one of the perks I get for being retired, Jim and I are going to be going June 11th and 12th and will join many people from Bread for the World to lobby our congressman in Washington, D.C. So it would be really important to, for me to be able to say this is how many people from our church are looking out and wanting us as a uh, United States to help fight hunger. Thank you. So something prompted you to come this morning. Either you had a role that you are responsible for fulfilling or this is your Sunday practice or there is a longing that you are feeling, a hunger, a desire to know and to be close to God. Whatever it is that has brought us together this morning, friends, know that you are welcome here as you are. And as we come together, friends, know the love of God and let us worship God together. call to worship. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims God's handiwork. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills clothe themselves with joy. The plants and trees show God's presence. Let us join with creation in praising God. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Sing to the glory of God's name. Give to God glorious praise. Let us pray. God of all creation, thank you for the goodness of the earth that you made and sustain. Let our voices join the chorus of creation, giving you praise, the roaring seas, and the songs of birds, the choreography of the sun and the moon, the silent dark night, and the brightness of snow. Let your spirit unite us, that we may be signs of your overflowing mercy, and live with grateful hearts for your grace, as we wait the completion of your creation in Jesus Christ. Amen.
We are made in God's image, and with all of creation, God has called us good. Yet we go our own way and harm others, harm one another, and harm the planet that is in our care. Confident in the mercy of God who made us and who saves us, let us confess our sin to God and to one another, the prayer of confession. Giver of life, in the midst of a plundered earth, we groan with creation. Have mercy on us. Giver of life, in the midst of poisoned water, we groan with creation. Have mercy on us. Giver of life, in the midst of polluted air, we groan with creation. Have mercy on us. Giver of life, in the midst of mountains of waste, we groan with creation. Have mercy on us. Giver of life, in the midst of rising seas, we groan with creation. Have mercy on us. God of life, forgive us for turning away from you, ignoring the needs of our neighbors and the cries of the earth. As the sun brings light and warmth to this earth, make us signs of your grace. Through Christ, our light and life, we pray. Hear the good news of God's mercy and blessing. You are forgiven. Be at peace. Share that blessing with others and care for this good earth that all creation may declare God's glory. Amen. All right, I invite our kids to come on up. Yeah, don't take a seat this time. It's going to be a little bit of a walking tour. So we're going to start up here. All right. So as we're up here, actually, let's look, we're going to stand up because we need to be able to kind of turn around and observe. Because I want to ask you, our friend Avery is going to be talking about creation and our care for creation. And I want to ask, where do you see creation in this, in this room? Where, what are some things where you're like, oh, that's creation? Yeah. Uh, the fly things, all the butterflies on the banner. What else do we see? The stained glass, so we see the, the sunlight coming through. Uh, you, you got my lesson, you got half my lesson right there. You, you are part of creation. You are made by God, yep. The cross made of wood. We also see some, some other stuff, Isla. The plants that are here. Yeah, Maddie. Oh, those shoes. Yeah, that's me. Um, <laughs> and so forth. So I want to bring our attention to a few other things. Now, Maddie kind of beat me to it, that sometimes we think, well, there's creation out there, and we sometimes go out and enjoy it, but how we're part of it, and we, we benefit from it, we're connected with it. But I want to show two other parts that maybe are easy to overlook. What do we have right here? What do we call this little meal there? Ret. We, it's bread, and that's a part of, and juice, and that's the meal that we call, I'll, I'll give you a sec, go for it, for communion. Now let me ask, where did the bread come from? Yeah, we're going way back, so yeah, absolutely, and we are so grateful to God. Go, go jump forward a little bit, Rhett. And Jesus, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely talking about Jesus' body, but let's say like just a piece of bread. We got some bread here. Where does the bread come from? It comes from wheat. Comes from wheat. Yeah, and where does wheat come from? And baked it. So it came from the wheat. And we baked it. And where does that wheat come from? You got an idea? Seeds. And even further, what do we put the seeds in? Uh, we got to go a little further back than that. So it ends up at the store, but it come from, or from, yeah, absolutely, the seeds that came from. How about dirt? It came from some dirt is what this came from. We put the seeds in the dirt. It grows out of the dirt. It's nurtured by the dirt. But if, same thing with this. Where does, where does the juice or the wine come from? Yeah.
Need some reflection time on that? No. Get your hand back up when you got it. All right, Janie. From fruits, yeah. Yeah, the grapes that came again out of the dirt. So every time that we, I think it's pretty cool that Jesus could have just said, hey guys, just remember to tell each other that I love you and died for you. Instead, he said, I want you to have this meal. Because it's not only a reminder of that, but it's a reminder too that we are connected to that dirt. We're connected to this good earth that grows the grains, grows the grapes, and that we're a part of it. So if we, if we were like, we're, if we kind of overworked our soil, or maybe if we had things that just washed all our soil out, would it be hard to get some of that grain and to grow some of those things if we don't have good soil? So every time we're doing this, like there's so much happening in communion that we remember, again, that we are connected to Christ and we're connected to the earth. So what have we got over here? What's this thing that we call right here? Yeah, baptize, baptism. And what do we use for baptism? Yeah, Brett, we use water. Oh, my goodness. So tell me, how's this water look right now? Wet. Looks wet, looks clean. Man, it looks good. Uh, you know, feel that water too, man. That is good stuff. I love, I just love water. So would you, if I had to pour it out, if I poured out some mucky, dirty water, would you be cool with that? Would you be sticking your hand in so eagerly? Yeah, yeah, well, y'all look cool like that. But I think that it's, I think that it's actually really important that, again, if we were welcoming somebody, we could just say, hey, man, God loves you. All right, cool, you're in. Instead, Jesus says to use this water and, like, what do we need more than any? Well, more than air. Well, air, definitely. But aside from air, what is the thing we need most in this world? We need water. And again, it reminds us that these are God's gifts. So as we share that meal, when we welcome people and say, you are God's child in this water, we're not just saying those things, but we are being reminded that the water and the dirt and the air is all God's gift. It's a part of God's love, and God uses us to also remind us of who Jesus is. Do so you think these would be things we should take care of? Yeah, take care of them, because like, you know, they're pretty awesome things, and they show our thanks to God, and also they show our care for other people, too, to make sure that they have enough to eat, that they have clean water, and that they are reminded of God's love in this world. So let's pray, for, let's give thanks to God and pray for these things and remind, remember what it invites us into. So repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for dirt and air and water and the ways that they show your love for the whole world and help us care for these gifts through Christ our Lord. Oh, Amen. Yeah, get one more hit of that water on your way out and let it be a reminder of your baptism and of God's love for the world.
In the Lord I'll be ever thankful, in the Lord I will rejoice. Look to God, do not be afraid, lift up your voices, the Lord is near. Lift up your voices, the Lord is near. In the Lord I'll be ever thankful, in the Lord I will rejoice. Look to God, do not be afraid, lift up your voices, the Lord is near. Lift up your voices, the Lord is near. Join me in the reading of today's scripture from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 36b through 48. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts Arise in your hearts. Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Well, in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. He said to them, have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and the forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The word of the Lord.
In his book titled, We Contain Multitudes, science author Ed Yong explores the multitude of things that live inside of us. The microbes that make us up, that you may have heard the term make up our microbiome. Yang explains that microbes are not just disease-causing entities, like we might think of them, but they're actually essential partners that sculpt our organs, that protect us from diseases, that help us break down our food, that educate our immune systems to protect us, and through all of these processes, even can change our very behavior. The core message of we contain multitudes is that life is a cooperative endeavor, that we are deeply interconnected, and that humans are not just individuals, but we're complex ecosystems inhabited by numerous microbial species. Indeed, the temple of our body is a busy, a full temple filled with all kinds of things that are not exactly us and all kinds of things that make us us. Now, this is easy for us to experience, and we actually do it every few seconds. So if you'll do this with me, take in a breath, a big breath, and let it out. What happens when we breathe? We're taking in something from the outside, and it is becoming part of us. Yes, oxygen, but also the little microbes that are floating around in the air enter into us and become a part of us. It's the way of life. The same is true when we drink a glass of water or when we eat. What is happening is that creation becomes part of us and we become part of creation. We often think of ourselves as independent units, as sort of these blobs that are moving through space, independent from each other and the rest of the world. But that's actually not really how our lives work, and it's certainly not how our bodies work. Other things intersect and interact with us. They make us who we are, and they shape how we act in the world. Yes, it's true of our microbiome, but it's also true of other things. It's true of the places we've lived, all the experiences that we've had, the friends who are all around us. Our body and our identity is a web of relationships that are working together to make us who we are. Every June for the past two years, I've had the gift of gathering with a group of scientists and theologians and ministers at the Duke University Marine Lab in coastal North Carolina. This is part of Creation Justice Ministries Pastoral Care for Climate Retreat. It's an amazing place where we come together across our disciplines, we learn from each other, we worship in nature, we see the local climate impacts that are happening in coastal North Carolina. But my favorite part is the oyster roast that we have on the first night of the retreat. Earlier in the day, a group goes out on a boat to Duke's oyster farm and harvests fresh oysters that the chefs roast up and share with us. As we're eating these oysters, we learn from scientists about the role that oysters play in a coastal ecosystem, the way that they're filter feeders, which means that they suck in the water and they filter out some of the pollutants, the bad things, and then they shoot out clean, healthy water. That's how they eat. Oysters also come together to build oyster reefs, which stabilize the banks from hurricanes, which is a helpful buffer in a time of climate change. We also learn about the ways that we're harming oysters, most significantly through the plastic pollution that ends up in our waterways and in our ocean. Now, plastic doesn't ever biodegrade. 
it doesn't ever break down all the way in the way that wood or cardboard or other things do. What happens with plastic is a process called photodegradation, that when the sun shines on it, it just breaks apart into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces until after years, it becomes these things called microplastics, these tiny pieces of plastics that are floating around in our water and sometimes in our soil. Researchers have found that oysters and other filter feeders, like mollusks and scallops, have some of the highest rates of microplastics inside of them. And that's because when they filter the water, that includes filtering the microplastics. They get stuck in the oysters and get stuck inside of their bodies. And when we eat those oysters, what happens? Those microplastics end up inside of us. And it's not just oysters, it's other fish that contain microplastics, food that's wrapped in plastic, and even the water that we drink out of a plastic bottle or out of our tap. Some scientists have estimated that the average person might eat five grams of microplastics in a week. That's a credit card worth of plastics that are ending up in our bodies. So yes, on one hand, our identity and our body is a web of relationships that are working together to make us who we are, but those relationships are not always positive ones, right? That our bodies are shaped both negatively and positively by what we eat. And the same is true for the body of the world. The health of the world and the health of creatures are intimately connected to the health of our own bodies. These plastics are infiltrating everywhere. Plastic has infiltrated almost every corner of the earth Researchers have found plastics in as far from places as the Arctic and in the remote corners of the deserts. They're also infiltrating our bodies and our imaginations. It's really hard to imagine a world without plastics. I think in some ways it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of plastics. Reverend Stephanie Allen who started Zero Waste Church, a ministry in Raleigh, North Carolina, has said that plastics are a sacrament to our God of convenience. In a moment when our plastic problem is degrading our bodies and the body of creation, the Easter message where we find ourselves in this Easter season might just offer a path forward. In the Easter season, we reflect on the good news of the resurrection, the good news of our incarnated God in flesh who overcame death to be with us. A God whose resurrection was a bodily resurrection, a restoration that didn't transcend the body, that wasn't just a resurrection of the spirit, but one that returns to and restores the body. We read in today's text from the Gospel of Luke that after the resurrection, Jesus appeared in his embodied form and joined the disciples. Of course, as you might expect, when Jesus appears to them, the disciples are doubtful and suspicious. Could it really be the return of our Lord? Is resurrection really possible? It has to just be a ghost. This can't be his actual body. Jesus showed them his hands and his feet. Jesus had them touch his hands and his feet, these wounded parts of his body, but still they weren't convinced that it was really him. But it seems like Jesus knew just the thing that would convince them. He asked them for a piece of fish to eat. He took it ate it, and opened their minds to all that had happened. Now, this isn't the only time that this happened. 
Actually, early on, earlier on in this very same chapter, in Jesus' first appearance to the disciples, when he appeared to them on the road to Emmaus, it was only when he first broke bread with the disciples and shared it with them that the disciples' eyes were open to see who he truly was. Perhaps what's happening here is that Jesus knows that it is in eating that we are most fully human. That the act of taking something that is not us into our body and making it part of us is a fundamental part of what it means to have a human body. Now, imagine if Jesus had eaten that piece of broiled fish today. It's likely that that fish would have had pieces of microplastics in it. And Jesus, like us, would have been constituted in part of plastic. Jesus didn't return from the crucifixion without wounds and scars, right? He's, he still bore the bodies, the scars of those who, who killed him. He bore those scars on his body, in his hands, and in his feet. The, the healing of the body, the restoration of Jesus' body, didn't mean a disappearance of all wounds. It didn't mean a disappearance of the sin that led to Jesus' crucifixion, but a repentance and forgiveness of those wounding sins. And that's what he calls his disciples to. The ministry of healing, the repentance and forgiveness of sins, is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations. And this is the work of the church. This is a mission that is repeated in the Acts of the Apostles. In this work of repentance and forgiveness, we first have to name the sin, right? To confess something, we have to name what's going on. So what's confession look like in our plastic world? Well, I think we need to think about sin as both an individual and a systemic sin. Conventionally, we often think of sin as the acts of harm that are com committed between individuals. And, and while this is true, of course, we commit acts of harm to each other and to God's good creation, we can't just stop there. That sin can also be found in the systems and structures of our world, in what Paul calls the powers and principalities. In our plastic world, we sin as individuals, when we overconsume plastic, when we harm our planet. But we also have to recognize that we live in a society where plastic is, both literally and figuratively, the water that we swim in. The plastic and the petrochemical industry have made it their project for plastics to infiltrate all parts of our lives. And we can do our best to make faithful decisions in the midst of this reality. But individually, we can't do it all. So then what does repentance look like for this individual and systemic plastic sin? Well, it's, it's good for us to remember what the word repentance really means. The Greek word for repentance means a complete turning away from sin heading in another direction, taking a 180-degree turn. For us in our individual lives, repentance could look like finding contentment in the things we have and not falling into the trap of bigger, newer, better. And it's also true that it's hard to find contentment within the bounds of an economy that is consistently telling us to buy newer and bigger and better. So the repentance that we need is both personal and economic. We need to move away from consumption in our personal lives and in our economic structures and move to connections with people, connections to creation, and with God. In our economy, we need to stop putting profits over the well-being of people and our planet. The good news of this is also that we have a God who forgives. That as we do our part, which we must do, we need to do, 
we also trust in the forgiving love and the grace of God who meets us and helps us along the way. That even when we fail, God forgives. So what can we do? What can we do about this plastics problem around us? Well, the month of April is Earth Month. April 22nd is Earth Day. And the global theme for Earth Day this year is planet versus plastics. There's people all around the world who are going to be educating and taking action and mobilizing to transform our relationship to plastics and to work together to push for a global treaty through the UN on plastic pollution. Throughout this month, other churches around the country are taking action on plastics as a part of their Earth Day mission. They're talking about plastics and plastic Jesus, and they're figuring out what it looks like to take action in their own community to limit plastic use. How do they stem the flow of single-use plastics, either in our lives of individuals or in our communities? Well, it starts with just looking around and seeing where can we limit or stop the use of single-use plastics. Maybe it's at community meals or events. Maybe we find compostable or reusable alternatives. It also means engagement in the public space, advocating for plastic bag bans at the city or the state level. It's a movement that's gained a lot of energy in the last few years, passing municipal bag bans. Pittsburgh just recently passed one that went into effect this year. And then also looking to the federal level, recognizing that our federal government can take action to reduce the, the faucet, turn off the faucet of plastics. Two bills that are in Congress right now that are trying to do this are the REDUCE Act, which puts a tax on new plastic, and the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, which holds plastic producers accountable for the pollution that they're creating. And then finally, at the denominational level, at the General Assembly coming up for the Presbyterian Church USA, there's going to be an overture on becoming free from plastic pollution which is encouraging all churches in all of our settings to commit to changing from a disposable culture to a reusable, sustainable culture. So the good news of today's gospel is that we see Jesus affirming his physical resurrection by sharing a meal with his disciples, by taking that fish it's a powerful act that underscores the importance of community and creation in making Jesus who he is and in making us who we are. It's a reminder that in our communities and every meal, every shared moment is an opportunity to acknowledge our interconnectedness and our responsibility toward each other and toward our planet. In this plastic moment, these communal actions that we take can reflect a call to care for our bodies and the body of creation. In each act of breaking bread together or of sharing fish together over every meal at every table can be a moment of commitment to protect and restore the world around us, to ensure that the world is restored to a place where future generations can still see and experience God's unbounding love and grace. Thanks be to God. I'm grateful for uh, the fact that Wayside, we don't always get it right, but I'm always grateful on Sunday after worship that we use mugs and cups out there that can be reused and washed and used again. And, and um, 
Avery and I were touching base just very briefly about uh, New Zealand, where I was blessed to spend a month this past year, and how a country like that has imagined what the world could be like without plastic. Uh, they try really hard, and throughout so much of the country, the things that we're used to being plastic here are not plastic there. Uh, they kind of prove that it's, it's possible. It's possible to do things differently. I direct your attention to the number of prayer concerns in our worship bulletin. Uh, grateful for Joan McClung making good progress at home. Um, Melanie Gatehouse is someone who uh, she and her husband Tom have been worshiping with us at 8.30 and she's on that roller coaster of uh, uncertainty and, and knowledge kind of going back and forth as she is undergoing testing for, uh, for medical concerns. And so even if you don't know Melanie, if you would add her to your prayers, I know she would be so grateful for that. And Roxanne Deal and the Deal family as they come to grips with uh, her struggle with ALS. We're so grateful for Mark and for his role here at Wayside. Karen Sidorowitz has asked for special prayers for Jonathan as uh, more troops are being uh, sent to the place where he is stationed, which unfortunately is in a place that's kind of close to where things are a little hot right now. So uh, we want to surround him and all of those troops with our prayer. Finally, I'm so grateful for the partnership we've had this weekend with St. Paul's Episcopal Church, with First Presbyterian Church of the Covenant, and with Sacred Heart uh, Catholic Parish as we've uh, explored creation justice together. How good it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. Let's turn to God with our prayers. O oh God, who we know by many names, you give us life and we live before you all our days. And so we come in our longing and our need and we turn to you in our prayers. Creator of all that is seen and unseen, thank you for all those places where your creatures nurture new life in sandy clutches of eggs, in woven nests, in coral beds, and in living bodies. We depend on you. Protect us, O oh God, for in you we take refuge. Risen Lord Jesus, teach us to see the earth as you see with care and compassion. Instruct our hearts and make us a people of resurrection hope lived out in the restoration of watershed and air, land and sea, of green spaces, forests, and what we have chosen to call wasteland, to remember that there is no God-forsaken place. Shepherd God who leads with gentleness, forbearance, and mercy, we look to you on all our paths and even in the shadow of death, Lead us back to the right way when we have drained the calm waters and cleared away forests. And by your grace, make us shepherds who sustain the earth entrusted to our care, that your mercy and goodness will follow us all the days of our lives. Our deliverer and rescuer, we gather to you and seek you season by season, and our hearts break because we see that things are not right when there is no snowfall or when summer comes early and stays late and when fisheries are depleted and fires rage wildly. God, have mercy. Do not let us live in shame. Brace us with a vision of feet treading in abundant grasslands. Give grace that we may do what will renew the blooms and make us stewards who cast our nets carefully. Protect us from our destructive tendencies that we may protect the vulnerable and beautiful creatures we live alongside. 
Hear our expansive prayers for ourselves, for those we love, and all the earth you privilege us to live within. God of all deep within, we long to make a joyful noise. Our voices and our choirs, our drums, together with hoots and warbles and whistles and shouts, giving you praise. Help us, great composer, so we will learn from the songbirds and wild things, so we will not cherish those ways that cause harm but find joy, exulting in your faithful love. Loving God, whose face we see in all the world around us, hear us as we raise our prayers to you. And now may the sound of our voices united in prayer be to you a song of faithfulness and hope as we pray in the name of the risen Lord Jesus the prayer he gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time as we respond to God's invitation, we can be a little bit fearful fearful when we are called to give, to serve, to embrace a new way of living. And I think our greatest hope in living, living out these ways of God is to know that we are not alone, to know God's faithfulness and generosity that is there with us as we give, live, give, serve, and make changes. So Jesus invites his followers to look to the birds, they don't farm, but God feeds them. Look to the flowers. They don't sow, yet God clothes them more beautifully than, than any of us will ever see. Does God not care about you as much as birds and flowers? So this week, in this moment as we give our gifts, and this week as we go through our life, allow yourself to observe in the natural world around you those signs of God's faithfulness and generosity. And may your heart be at peace. Friends, let us give our gifts to the Lord.
Thanksgiving, let us pray. Gracious God, the risen Jesus invited his disciples to set aside their doubts and fears. Free us too from these things so we may faithfully walk in Christ's ways of generosity, welcome, and love. Bless these gifts so the whole world may walk in newness of life. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Creator God, and in the restoration of the Christ, our Christ who is resurrected and embodied, may you go in peace and in power.